Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Welcome to part two of my comments on the Passion Translation. In the last video, I gave you a brief introduction to the Passion Translation and its lead translator, Dr. Brian Simmons. I also responded to two of the main objections to the Passion Translation. Number one, it's done by an individual, and number two, Brian Simmons isn't qualified to be a translator. I'll link to that video in the description. In this video, I'm going to cover three more objections. Objection number three, the Passion Translation takes liberties with the text. Okay, this is supposed to be evidence that the Passion Translation is adding to Scripture. So let's take a look at the same passage in the Amplified Bible. All Scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. For the record, the Amplified Bible was done by a woman named Frances Seward. Here's the passage in the Expanded Translation. All Scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God, God breathed, and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in their lives, refuting error, rebuking, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right, training in righteousness, using the Scriptures so that the person who serves God God's person will be capable, competent, having all that is needed, fully equipped to do every good work. So why aren't these people on a crusade against the Amplified Bible and the Expanded Translation? I think the answer is obvious. They're not associated with Bill Johnson and Bethel. This complaint is theologically driven rather than philosophically driven about the proper way to do translation. You see, all translations have to take some liberties with the text, because if they didn't, it wouldn't make much sense. A strict word-for-word -word translation would leave the reader totally confused. For example, 2 Corinthians 6.11 in the interlinear says, The mouth of us has been opened to you, Corinthians. The heart of us has been expanded. The King James translation, considered more of a word-for-word -word translation, says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you. Our heart is enlarged. This is what we refer to as formal equivalence. But in the New King James, it says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. The New King James uses a hybrid approach that it calls complete equivalence. And in the Holman translation, it reads, We have spoken openly to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. Holman uses what it calls optimal equivalence, which is kind of a hybrid as well. The New Living Translation reads, O oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you and our hearts are open to you. It uses what translators refer to as dynamic equivalence or functional equivalence. So you can see that there are several approaches to Bible translation with varying degrees of literalness or paraphrasing. Now, the Passion Translation uses what it refers to as essential equivalence, which to me is no different from dynamic equivalence. The Passion Translation is an essential equivalence translation. The Passion Translation maintains the essential form and essential function of the original words. It is a meaning for meaning translation, translating the essence of God's original message and heart into modern English. We agree with Fee and Strauss. Accuracy in a translation relates to equivalent meaning. Brian Simmons uses the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, but includes the use of the Aramaic Peshitta as well to help bring out meanings that he believes were lost in translation. So naturally, his methodology is going to be more wordy, somewhat like the Amplified Bible or the Expanded Translation. So the wordiness isn't so much a matter of adding to the text as it is a result of his methodology. That methodology might be controversial, but as you can see, it's not totally unprecedented. The fact is, you can find objectionable translations in just about every Bible version out there. In the passage about Jesus' transfiguration, the ESV says, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John 
and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Mark 9, 2 and 3. Bleach? Bleaching is a chemical process that began in the late 1700s. The original Greek doesn't use the word bleach. The interlinear of the Greek translates the word for bleach in the ESV, Lucani, as to whiten. The NIV uses bleach too. Why, they're changing the Bible. Not really. It's just a judgment call. The ESV committee probably discussed it and decided that even though the chemical process of bleaching wasn't around back then, the natural process of whitening fabric in the sun was. But since most people aren't familiar with that process today, they just use the word bleach. This is actually fairly common with the translation process. Here's a clip of the ESV committee debating whether to translate the word doulos as servant or slave. I'm thinking of the principal male word, eved. It occurs a lot in the Bible, it's about 800 times. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those we currently have as servant. But if you were to make the word slave consistent and start using it for the verb, then you'd end up being slaves um, before God, you'd be slaving for him and so on. So I feel the most consistent way is to put servant everywhere. If you look at the dictionaries, it's quite clear that the difference between a servant and a slave is whether they are owned by the master or whether they're paid by their employer. And it's quite clear in many passages in the Old Testament where it talks about Eved, that the person is owned, is regarded as part of the property of that person. In the text of 1 Corinthians 7, the change is at four instances from slave to bondservant. Uh, those who are in favor, please raise your hands. We have nine, those opposed. Uh, we have three, thank you. Speaking of slaves, in this clip, Winger says that Brian Simmons is adding to Romans 1.1 1, 1 when Paul refers to himself as a slave. And so he makes claims about his translation, like the word doulos, which any first year Greek student already knows this. The word doulos, it just means servant or slave. That's, what, that's all, it, all it means. That's the entire meaning of it. And Brian Simmons translates it in Romans 1 and says it means a servant who serves his master out of love and not out of obligation. And, and this is like demonstrably false. Now, this is ridiculous. First of all, that's not what his translation says. It says, Paul, a loving and loyal servant of the anointed one, Jesus. I think what Winger is referring to here is the footnote that says, the Greek word doulos signifies more than a servant. It is one who has chosen to serve a master out of love, bound with cords so strong that it could only be severed by death. Now, technically, Mike might have a point here. But I think what Brian Simmons was saying is that it means more than a servant when used metaphorically, which is the case in Romans 1.1 1, 1 and other greetings. Remember, the Passion Translation is a thought-for-thought -thought translation. So there's no need to demand a literal word-for-word -word translation here when doulos is obviously used metaphorically. Let's read what gotquestions.org has to say about bondservants. Throughout the New Testament, the word bondservant, slave, or servant is applied metaphorically to someone absolutely devoted to Jesus. Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, and Jude all describe themselves as bondservants of Christ. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says about Romans 1.1, 1, 1, servant, doulos, means slave, a person owned by another. Paul wrote this title gladly, reveling in the Old Testament picture of a slave who, in love, binds himself to his master for life. So, consistent with his methodology, Brian Simmons communicates what the metaphorical use of doulos is trying to convey. I don't see anything unprofessional or unethical about this translation or the footnote. In Texas, this is what we call nitpicking. Folks, just Google any Bible translation you want and add mistakes or problems or satanic, and you'll find that they all have their detractors. Does that mean that the Passion Translation is okay? No. But at the same time, the fact that a lot of people don't like the Passion Translation doesn't mean that it's not okay. In this clip, Mike says that Brian Simmons is adding to the Bible. But the revelation about John 22 has gotten him in some hot water because people are like, wait a minute. You mean you're telling us you are going to add to the Bible another yeah. chapter? 
Like you're just saying, I'm going to add to the Bible. I have new information. This is in reference to Brian Simmons' appearance on Sid Roth's show, It's Supernatural, where he discussed a vision he had of a library in heaven where he saw a book entitled John 22. What was the title? Written on the cover of the book was John 22. Uh, but there's only 21 chapters in John. What's this 22? Well, John 22, go back to John 14, 12, and you'll see that there is a greater works generation. The works that I do, you will do even greater works than these. I believe the John 22 generation will be a people that do the greater works of Jesus. Now, first of all, he didn't put 22 chapters in his translation of John, okay? And he didn't say that he ever would. He just said that he saw a book in heaven that had that title, and everybody gets all bent out of shape. But then Mike says something that is very misleading. He says that Brian walked back what he said about adding to the Bible. And so he later walked this back, and he was like, oh, no, I'm not adding anything to the Bible. Here's what Brian said in that appearance in 2015. They will not add to the scripture, and, and that's a sealed book. But it is a book that is unfolding, and the works of Jesus will be replicated by an entire generation of people that believe fully in the power of God. So he clearly said that nothing's being added to the book of John. It's a sealed book. So there was nothing to walk back because he said it's a closed canon from the start. John ended his gospel by talking about all the works that Jesus did. Brian didn't get to read the book, so he's just speculating that it's about the works that Jesus will continue to do on earth through his church. Now, just so you know, there's a Calvinist church planning organization called Acts 29. Of course, the book of Acts only has 28 chapters, so are these guys adding to the Bible? No, they're just using that name as a way of saying that the work of spreading the gospel continues in this generation. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with saying that there will be more works of Jesus in this generation that are recorded in a book called John 22. It's the same idea, guys. Objection number four. The Passion Translation gets a lot of things wrong. The critics cite several examples of things that they consider poor translation or paraphrasing if you prefer. In this clip, Mike says that Brian Simmons translates the word scribes as religious scholars, but scribes weren't religious scholars. So scribes or Pharisees, they're not just called scribes, they're called religious scholars, which is a wrong representation of scribe, right? They're scribes. The term doesn't mean religious scholar, but he calls them religious scholars. Why? To come maybe to set the ground for dismissing people like me, who just, you study and you logic chop and you do all your research. <laughs> like, I don't know. The scribes were just scribes, which I guess is supposed to mean that they just took dictation and copied documents and they had no real authority as religious leaders. But then why did Jesus say scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites in Matthew 23? Six times he said, woe to you, scribes. Woe to you, scribes. You travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Now, if all these guys did was take dictation, why is Jesus going off on them like that? Huh? Because they were, in fact, religious scholars, just as Brian Simmons stated. In the King James, Matthew 23, 2 says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. But in the NIV, it reads, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In the New Living Translation, it says, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. Weist Expanded New Testament says, the men learned in the scriptures and the Pharisees occupy the professional chairs of authoritative teachers whose responsibility it is to interpret Moses. And the New English translation reads, the experts in the law and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So the Passion Translation isn't the only translation that refers to the scribes as religious scholars. Let's read from encyclopedia.com about the scribes. A group of Jewish leaders who flourished from the time of the exile until the destruction of the Jewish state by Titus in 70 AD. Originally, their name was used merely of clerks whose function was to copy royal and sacred manuscripts. Later, the title signified the official post of one who was learned in the Law of Moses. 
The people admired the scribes' erudition and their interpretations of precedence and tradition. Sirach extols the work of the scribes. At the time of Christ, many of the scribes adhered to the teachings of the Pharisees and shared their casuistry, legalism, and externalism. With the chief priests, Sadducees, and Pharisees, the scribes composed the Jewish aristocracy of the time, and many were members of the Sanhedrin. So while scribes were originally just clerks, by Jesus' day they'd become religious scholars, and thus were on the receiving end of Jesus' rebuke. And the point is clear that being a religious scholar doesn't mean that you're right with God, and that you can miss the time of your visitation despite all of your religious education. That was true in Jesus' day, and it's true today. So Mike Winger is wrong here. Yes, folks, Mike Winger does get things wrong occasionally, just as we all do. Last year, he published a video criticizing Brian Houston's use of Luke 1.30 from the Passion Translation, and then discovered that he was actually reading from the message, a highly idiomatic translation published in 2002. When he realized his mistake, he quickly unlisted the video and issued an apology. I made my recent video on Brian Houston unlisted. I just found out he was quoting the message rather than the passion. At least he was willing to admit that he was wrong. Some of these critics never do, even after you prove them wrong repeatedly. Now, I like Mike, and I'm subscribed to his channel. He's a good Bible teacher, and most people would probably say he's better than I am. And maybe they're right. But sometimes he gets things wrong, and this is one of those times. And I think it's interesting and even relevant that what was probably his biggest mistake as a YouTuber involved the Passion Translation. This is what can happen when your narrative becomes more important than the facts. But when you're making an allegation against somebody, you have an obligation to get your facts right. Now, if you read through the reviews of the message, you'll find that the translation community doesn't have much good to say about it. Here's what GotQuestions.org has to say about it. Suffice it to say that the message has engendered more criticism for its lack of serious scholarship and outright bizarre renderings than just about any other Bible version to date. One common complaint from many who read the message or hear it read aloud is, I don't recognize it as the Bible. Other critics declare the message to be not a paraphrase of what the Bible says, but more of a rendering of what Eugene Peterson would like it to say. In an interview with Christianity Today, Peterson described the beginning of the creative process that produced the message. I just kind of let go and became playful. And that was when the Sermon on the Mount started. I remember I was down in my basement study and I did the Beatitudes in about 10 minutes. And all of a sudden I realized this could work. Aside from the impossibility of doing justice to the Sermon on the Mount in 10 minutes, one wonders whether playfulness is the appropriate demeanor for those who attempt to rightly divide the word of truth. Awe and reverence for a holy God and his holy word, yes. Playfulness, no. Ouch. And here's what BibleResearcher.com says. We notice how Peterson's instruction to wives here differs somewhat from Peter's instructions. Peterson strips away any suggestion that the women are to subject themselves to their husbands. Although, obviously, this is the main point of the passage, as written by Peter. Instead of respecting, submitting to, or obeying their husbands, the wives are to be responsive to their needs and taking care of them like mothers. Turning to the men, Peterson puts the idea of wifely submission out of bounds by telling them, you're equals. He explains that the woman is a weaker vessel only in a sociological sense, that women lack some of your advantages. Here, it seems that Peterson has simply replaced the teaching of the passage with its opposite. Ouch again! So why doesn't Mike Winger go after the message with the same vitriol that he goes after the Passion Translation with? Well... Eugene Peterson, the guy behind the message, was a Presbyterian rather than a Charismatic. No big-name Charismatics endorsed the message, although Max Lucado and J.I. Packer did. In my opinion, this is more evidence that Winger's crusade against the Passion Translation is theologically driven. Does Brian Simmons get things wrong? Sure, and he's admitted that. In fact, it says on the Passion Translation website that the Passion Translation conducts a full formal review of the text every two years, 
but makes critical updates to biblical text or footnotes on the next print run so readers can have the latest and best translation of the Bible text. Objection number five, the Passion Translation is a paraphrase, not a translation. A lot has been made of the fact that Brian Simmons refers to the Passion Translation as a translation rather than a paraphrase. Almost every review I've read considers it a paraphrase. Even Dr. Brown said that. So why does Brian Simmons refer to it as a translation? Well, there are different ways of defining a paraphrase. Some people consider a paraphrase to be a rewording of an existing translation. For example, the Living Bible is a paraphrase of the American Standard Version. It wasn't taken from the original Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic. This is how Brian Simmons defines a paraphrase, and it's also why he doesn't consider the Passion Translation a paraphrase because he used the original languages during the process. Bill Mounts, the director of the Greek language program at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, says this about the term paraphrase. Linguists use paraphrase for a rewording for the purpose of simplification in the same language, not in a different language. So the Living Bible is a true paraphrase since it's a simplification of the English ASV. But viewing a translation from the Hebrew and Greek as a paraphrase is an incorrect use of the term. Now, according to Wikipedia, Bill Mounts was the New Testament chair of the English Standard Version translation of the Bible and is serving on the NIV Translation Committee. So I would say that he's qualified to speak on this matter. Other people define a paraphrase as a translation from the original languages that seeks to put the wording in modern English. A good example of this would be the message, which is highly idiomatic but was still taken from the original languages. But whether we're talking about a translation or a paraphrase, there's a certain amount of rewording that has to take place in every version of the Bible. Because again, if you were to do a strict word-for-word -word translation, it would really be hard to understand. For example, 1 Samuel 24, 3 in the King James says, And he came to the sheepcoats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now, what are sheep coats? And why did Saul go in the cave to cover his feet? Remember, the King James is a pretty literal translation, but it's also hard to understand for that very reason. So a more thought-for-thought -thought translation, like the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, when Saul came to the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there, and he went in to relieve himself. David and his men were staying in the back of the cave. Easier to understand, right? Sheep coats are sheep pens, and cover his feet is a Hebrew idiom for relieve himself. That's why the literal translations aren't always the best. But the problem is that when you engage in thought-for-thought -thought translation, you bring the human factor into the equation because different people will have different ways of understanding the original text or rewording it. So there's a certain amount of paraphrasing that happens with every translation. The question is, if you define a paraphrase as a rewording of the original languages, as many do, and if all translations require a certain amount of rewording, at what point does the rewording of the translation qualify it as a paraphrase rather than a translation? That's a gray area. So while you might take issue with referring to the Passion Translation as a translation, you have to allow for the fact that there's some disagreement in definitions here. A good example of that can be found in Winger's interview with Dr. Douglas Moo, one of the scholars chosen for Mike's anti-passion translation crusade. The passion translation is a new version of God's word that is considered a translation because it uses the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek manuscripts to translate the essential meaning of the scriptures into contemporary English. I don't have a quarrel with that, actually. I think the trans does need to be seen as uh, uh, effectively bringing the meaning across from one language to another. So I don't, I don't actually have a problem with using the word translation there. So do you think that it's the, the, let me put this in a slightly different context. The Passion Translation presents itself as a translation as opposed to a paraphrase. Um, and what are your thoughts on that? I, I'm not myself very happy with the distinction between translation and paraphrase. Hmm. So you don't like the distinction itself. That's interesting. 
So Dr. Mu has no problem calling the Passion Translation a translation. One final point regarding the translation process Dr. Simmons used. On occasion, he's referred to the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic texts that he used to create the Passion Translation. Well, as is commonly known, there are no remaining original manuscripts in existence. When people like Brian Simmons refer to the original texts, they're referring to the original language texts, not the originals themselves. In other words, they're referring to the existing copies of the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. They're not trying to mislead people about using what scholars refer to as the autographs, the original writings of the biblical authors. Here's a few examples of this. On the olivetree.com website, it says, translated directly from the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts, God's Word translation uses a linguistic translation method similar to the ones used by missionary translators throughout the world today. And for the ESV, it says, to achieve the greatest possible accuracy in an English translation of the original Hebrew and Greek texts, the translators of this readable modern Bible version have attempted to write what is, as much as possible, a word-for-word -word rendering of the text. Now, they're not saying that these versions are literally taken from the original text because, as I said, they don't exist. But people understand what they're saying. They're translating from the copies of the original text in the original languages. Okay? But the most serious problem that I have with Mike Winger's criticism is when he calls Brian Simmons a liar. We can actually test Brian Simmons' claims about other things, maybe not divisions. I can test his claims about his education and his experience mm -hmm. and his past. And when I show that he's not telling the truth about those things, we have good reason to think that he's probably not telling the truth about these visions too. He worked with them for over 30 years, Jerry McDaniels. And he works for Ethnos 360, right? At that time, New Tribes Mission. Mm -hmm. He says, nobody in our mission would ever say that he is a Bible translator or ever was approved as a Bible translator. Well, Brian's, he's lying. He's just saying things happen that didn't happen at all. He's um, fabricating his credentials. Yeah, if, on the face of it, he's not telling the truth about, about his training, yeah. about what he did with the Payakuna people. The it's guy's not honest about his past. Why would I think he's being telling the truth about these visions he's saying? I think he's deceiving people. Yeah. And that he's doing this for the money. He's, he's working his way through the Old Testament to translate mm -hmm. it, but the entire Bible is not translated yet. It's yeah, released each, in each book comes out one at a time and then you can yeah. buy it individually. It's like a really good money-making plan, actually. Good marketing. Yeah. Okay, it's fine to criticize the man's work. And if you don't like his translation, you don't like it. Like I said, every translation has its critics. But it seems like only Mike Winger and those who listen to him are making this accusation. And as for Brian Simmons doing this for the money, he's on record that the proceeds from the Passion Translation go into the ministry funds, and he works for a salary. I have signed away my rights to the Passion Translation to our ministry, and the ministry itself holds that copyright, not Candace and I. So I just want you to know that we, we do not get... Uh, we do not get uh, royalty money from the Passion Translation. We are paid a salary through our ministry. So what this all boils down to is the allegation of dishonesty. If Brian Simmons is lying, then he should be exposed. I have no problem with exposing frauds. I've done it myself on a blog I used to run. I was even threatened with a defamation lawsuit by a man who ended up in prison. I've seen ministers here in Tulsa exposed as frauds by other ministers, and I have no problem with that. The Bible tells us to expose the works of darkness. And I could be totally wrong about Brian Simmons. Like I said, I've never met the guy. I've just talked to him a couple of times on the phone. He could be an axe murderer for all I know. But if you're going to make serious allegations against the man, you have to do it with evidence, not opinions and speculation, which is all we have at this point. The Bible says not to entertain an accusation against an elder without two or three witnesses, 1 Timothy 5.19. It says not to slander your brother, James 4.11. So if you're one of the people making the allegation that Brian Simmons is lying, that he made up the story about a visitation from Jesus and is misrepresenting himself in order to sell the Passion Translation and make a lot of money in the process, then bring the evidence. Get the people who have worked with him on record publicly stating that he's a fraud. 
two or three of them, like the Bible says. Get the documents, the money trail, audio, video, whatever. Prove the allegation or don't make the allegation. At this point, I'd like to show you an example of some of the fruit of Mike Winger's attacks on the Passion Translation. On his Facebook page, Winger said that Brian Simmons claims that an angel helps him in the translating. In that post, he provided a link to a conversation between Sid Roth and Brian Simmons to support that claim. And now, here's a clip of some young people attempting to do discernment discussing the Passion Translation. The guy explaining to the others has obviously been listening to Mike Winger. He got it from inspiration and feeling Mercy. because an angel named Passion. Mercy. Oh, wow. Red flag. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, Galatians 1.8. If even I or an angel comes to you and speaks any other gospel. Well, hey, Joseph Smith go. got his stuff from an angel, right? I mean. <laughs> Not true at all. They're saying basically that Brian Simmons claims to have received his translation from an angel named Passion, just like Joseph Smith received the Book of Mormon from the angel Moroni. No, he didn't receive the translation from an angel or anybody else. He translates it slowly and methodically, just like every other translator, a few verses at a time. And he says that the whole Bible won't be translated until 2024. So where does the angel come in? Well, in the audio clip Mike Winger cited, Brian Simmons says that he saw an angel in his church once and the Lord spoke to him and told him it's the angel of passion. So he named the translation after that angel he saw. That's it. D did he tell you the name of the Bible? No, he didn't. He just So where'd you come up with the word passion translation? Well, uh, years ago, I saw an angel named Passion in our church meeting. And uh, the Lord spoke to me, not, not audibly, but internally, and said, that angel is with your ministry. It's the angel of passion. There's no Joseph Smith scenario here, but that's the rumor that they're now spreading. Now, I'm not making the case that the Passion Translation is a good translation, and I'm not endorsing it. I don't endorse any translation or paraphrase. I think all of them have some value. The more tools we have in our tool belt, the better able we'll be to fully understand God's Word. I'm making the case that Mike hasn't made his case regarding Brian Simmons' integrity or lack thereof. His evidence is flimsy and his work is shoddy in my opinion. Can you imagine if you were a prosecuting attorney and you presented a case against the defendant only to have the defense tear your case apart and the defendant goes free? You can imagine people would hold you accountable for wasting the taxpayer's money on a case you couldn't win. Well, when you're making an accusation against a Bible teacher, or in this case, a Bible translator, you have accountability to somebody far more important than any taxpayers. Look, if you don't like the Passion Translation, then don't use it. But don't reject it because Mike Winger doesn't like it. And don't accuse Brian Simmons of doing anything wrong because of what Mike Winger says. So I guess what all this boils down to is, do you believe that God gave Brian Simmons this assignment? If you do, then maybe the Passion Translation is for you. But of course, you should use it along with other translations and study aids. And if you don't believe that God gave him this assignment, then I guess the Passion Translation isn't for you. And I think that's where we should leave it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, share it, and subscribe. And if you didn't enjoy it, you're probably one of 200,000 Mike Winger subscribers. What can I say? We'll see you next time.